There's a global threat that most of us don't see. If it's removed, we won't have to worry about climate change or nuclear war or the mass extinctions in the animal kingdom that are going on as we speak. The threat is you. If there were no people, there would be nobody to drop the bomb on. There'd be no traffic jams and fewer cows would be farting in factory farms, so carbon emissions would plummet. Sure, the species threatened by our spread and dominance would be killing each other still, but they do a far less efficient job than we have. While no one is publicly advocating that we delete the human species altogether, there have been, for centuries, suggestions that we thin the herd. These suggestions have taken forms both subtle and explicit. The most common euphemism for this idea is population control. In its modern form, the idea was first popularized by British economist and minister Thomas Robert Malthus. In his essay on the principle of population, Malthus wrote that population and food supply increase at different rates. Let's assume a country of one million people with a food supply for a million people. Let's assume further that we don't have any crop failures, famine, disasters, or war. Everything is just peachy. Population, says Malthus, will increase geometrically. Imagine, for example, that over 25 years it will double to 2 million. In 50 years, it'll double again to 4. In 75, it'll double once more to 8. But food supply will only increase arithmetically. In other words, in 25 years, we'll have food for 2 million people. So things will still be peachy. But in 50 years, when the population is at 4 million, we'll only have food to fill 3 million stomachs. In 75 years, when there are 8 million hungry mouths to feed, the food supply will only be sufficient for half the population. As you probably guess, things won't be peachy anymore. There are big problems with Malthus's essay, but it was taken very seriously. His ideas were implemented to disastrous effect. According to Scientific American, the English Poor Law implemented by Queen Elizabeth I in 1601 to provide food to the poor was severely curtailed by the Poor Law Amendment Act of 1834, based on Malthusian reasoning that helping the poor only encourages them to have more children and thereby exacerbate poverty. The British government had a similar Malthusian attitude during the Irish potato famine of the 1840s. Famine, in the words of Assistant Secretary to the Treasury Charles Trevelyan, was an effective mechanism for reducing surplus population. And Malthus's influence wasn't restricted to public policy. His work's greatest impact, perhaps, was in shaping scientific culture. Darwin himself was influenced by Malthus, crediting the famous essay with helping to inspire evolutionary theory. Darwin's cousin, Francis Galton, applied the survival of the fittest policy to human society, with very ugly results. Population control was given a new name and the endorsement of a so-called science, eugenics. Eugenics in its day wasn't seen as a fringe pseudoscience. On the contrary, many celebrities and progressive thinkers openly advocated for it. According to the British Library, conservatives, liberals, and socialists all embraced eugenic ideas. Socialists such as the writers H.G. Wells and George Bernard Shaw were attracted to the notion that the state, rather than individuals, would be charged with the task of managing the development of population. Only the state was in a position to be able to do so with the greater good in mind, they believed. Such views led to the forced sterilization of up to 70,000 women in the United States alone. In 1927, the Supreme Court, by a vote of 8 to 1, upheld the state of Virginia's right to sterilize Carrie Buck, who was judged to be feeble-minded. Ideas like these helped inspire the racial policies of the Nazis, who embarked on an unrelenting massacre to preserve the purity of the so-called Aryan bloodline. You would think, after these atrocities, that the question of population control, by whatever name it was called, would finally be put to rest. But you'd be wrong. American doctors continued sterilizing patients against their will long after World War II. From 1970 to 1976, between 25 and 50 percent of Native American women were sterilized by the Indian Health Service. Aaron Blakemore writes, Two 15-year-old Native American women went in the hospital for tonsillectomies and came out with tubal ligations. Cheyenne women had their fallopian tubes severed, sometimes after being told that they could be untied again. 
Crimes so brazen had to be kept from the public eye, but Malthusians found a way to put a smiling face on these demonic ideas. Perhaps the most popular spokesperson for this ideology is Dr. Paul Ehrlich. Here's a clip of him on The Tonight Show, where he was a recurring guest. Well, let's start back where we were talking 10 years ago, because I remember one night you quoted a statistic on that show about population and the growth in the world generally from something like Sunday to Wednesday night, right? And you gave a figure of yeah. the total increase, births versus deaths, or the total increase in population. How much has the world increased in population if you can say 10 years? Well, in 10 years, we've, uh, we're pushing, putting on a billion people during that a thousand time. thousand million people. Yeah, so uh, we're putting on about uh, 75 million a year still, even though there's been a very slight decrease in the actual percentage rate, but the percent is applied to a bigger capital right. each time. So uh, the population is still growing like a skyrocket, although there have been so few cheery signs there. I mean, it's mostly gloom and doom, but uh, as you know, things have slowed yeah. off a bit in the United States. We are at replacement reproduction, and there are some signs that the rate is slowing in the rest of the world, but uh, nowhere's near enough sign because yeah. we're still committed to something like 6 billion people by the end of the century, and uh, that's 2 billion more than we have now. We're not doing a very good job now. There are going to be food and all the resources and schools. It's and all the all those funny things that we're now hassling over. Uh, things are going to be very, very tight. If, if biologists or sociologists ever gotten together, and I hear these, these figures, I think that's what confuses people. They say the world can support many more millions of people. I mean, we have something plus 4 billion, give or minus a few, and it can support 20 billion. Then you hear other people say there's no way you can do that because 60% of the world right now, I think, children are... On undernourished diet, are they? No, there's there's a tremendous amount of undernourishment. All resources are tending to be short. I mean, if everything is so abundant and we can do so much, how come we're so upset when the Russians move a few more inches towards a little bit of petroleum in the in the Middle East? Yeah. In other words, uh, I have a standard answer, as you know, for people who say we can support 20 billion people easily. Uh, we have a little over four billion today. Large numbers of them are undernourished. We don't have enough energy uh, to go around, people think. The environment is deteriorating and so on. Why don't we try doing a really good job with four billion people? See if we can do that. After we got four billion people well taken care of in a clean environment with good health and everybody's fed and everybody has opportunities and so on, then we can say, gee, all right, maybe we could do with five. What would be the advantage of five? Well, there would be another half a billion women, for instance, which I would find. You like that? Advantage. Yeah, I'm right. But, but, uh Ehrlich made a number of apocalyptic predictions. In his 1968 book, The Population Bomb, he predicted that hundreds of millions of people would starve to death over the next two decades. In 1974's The End of Affluence, Ehrlich increased the projection to over a billion dead from famine. Before 1985, he wrote, mankind will be reaching an age of genuine scarcity, and the accessible supplies of many key minerals will be nearing depletion. Ehrlich even went so far to state, if I were a gambler, I would take even money that England will not exist in the year 2000. Such frightening pronouncements, no doubt, helped his work reach bestseller lists and contributed to his rise as a public intellectual. Like all Malthusians, though, he had one problem. He was spectacularly wrong. Dr. Julian Simon, professor of business administration at the University of Maryland and senior fellow at the Cato Institute, called Ehrlich's bluff. Simon and Ehrlich agreed to a bet that the price of chromium, copper, tin, nickel, and tungsten would rise over the next 10 years. Ehrlich and some of his colleagues invested a total of $1,000 into these materials and proceeded to wait for the rise in cost attending the catastrophe that was sure to come. Simon agreed to pay the difference if the prices rose, but they didn't. In October of 1990, Simon received a check for $576.07 from Ehrlich. And that was the end of the overpopulation lie, right? The Club of Rome, still active today, used computer simulation to predict a coming population bomb, which would lead to global catastrophe. Their 1972 report, The Limits to Growth, had an international impact. According to the Cato Institute, in the 1970s, encouraged by tens of millions of dollars loaned from the World Bank, the Swedish International Development Authority, and the UN Population Fund, India began large-scale sterilization efforts. These efforts peaked in 1975 when the Prime Minister suspended civil liberties in a national emergency and sterilized over 6 million people in a single year. In 1979, China instituted its infamous one-child policy, inspired by the limits to growth. 
The club is comprised of influential members in government, politics, and academia. Canadian Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau, Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev, King Juan Carlos I of Spain, and Princess Beatrix of the Netherlands are among its current and former members. In case you think they've changed their ways, here's a recent video from the Club of Rome. This is absolutely real, and every bit as dystopian as you'd imagine. The world has never been so rich, but we're still susceptible to shocks and crises. Can we build more resilient societies? Not utopian, but functioning and fair. This is the story of Earth for All. We assembled a group of economic thinkers and scientists and develop a computer model to test their big ideas. We then asked, what's possible in one generation? If we carry on as normal, population and material footprints continue to grow, particularly due to overconsumption in rich countries. The gap between the richest and everyone else widens. Social tensions worsen. Climate change impacts become ever worse. But what if the world takes a giant leap now, with five extraordinary turnarounds? In this possible and plausible future, all people can live a good life within safer planetary boundaries. We avoid the worst climate impacts. Poverty ends earlier. Population peaks lower. Well-being rises. Social tensions fall. Nature starts to heal. Malthus, influential as his ideas have been, was wrong in his fundamental assumptions. Remember, he was convinced that population would increase geometrically while food supply would only increase arithmetically. Anthony Davies, associate professor of economics at Duquesne University, writes that since Essay on the Principal Population was published, not only did food production grow geometrically, it grew even faster than the population, so that the world can feed today's 8 billion far more easily than it could feed Malthus's 1 billion. Yet, for two centuries, experts have repeated Malthus' error by predicting the end of the world every time the population approaches another round number. The 20th century's numerous and devastating famines due to political mismanagement or natural disasters have shown that starvation, even on a mass scale, is a very serious possibility. It's essential that we take care of our environment and that we find ways to supply resources to areas and people who lack them. But population control isn't the way forward. Like Marxism, the belief in a geocentric universe, or the 8-track player, it ought to be a relic of the past. Thanks so much for watching. Check out the link in the description for some of my other work, and please like and subscribe. I'll see you on the next video.